Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, webinar. Today we'll be talking about validating ERP in order to prepare for operation and, and, uh, and the operation challenge as it is. And I have to say that uh, a lot of stuff is going on in the, in the ERP world right now. A lot of stuff is going on also with the cloud being introduced uh, to the life science industry. We have the CSA, uh, the computer system, computer system automate assurance it is, sorry about that, is being introduced by the FDA also. And actually, and quite frankly, a lot of uh, interesting things to talk about and, and which all relate to computer systems validation and to uh, ERP validation in particular. And today uh, I have Annie with me. Hi Annie. Annie is our principal consultant working with uh, ERP and validation of uh, ERP systems in general. And what we want to do today is to talk uh, about these new trends, talk about how that uh, relates to ERP validation, talk about how things were in the old school world, how things are going to be in the, in the new world with the cloud. Then we're going to touch on the changes that CSA really uh, gives us. What does that really mean uh, to ERP? Um, how can we cope with the validation? Uh, how can we optimize? Yeah, and things of, uh, of, of that nature. So um, I think I have been showing this slide maybe a thousand times. Uh, Epista, we've been here for almost 12 years now. And really our company is, uh, is focused on continuously improving regulatory compliance. For us, uh, that means uh, quite a lot. It means that we talk about and we develop and pioneer new methodologies every time that new technologies is coming into the life science industry. We do not want to be in a situation where a new technology cannot be adopted uh, into the life science industry. If that is the case, then we need to come up with methodologies which makes it possible for you guys to adopt that specific technology. And that has never been more true than it is right now for ERP systems with the cloud coming in. We also talk a lot about uh, IT, we talk a lot about QA, we talk about a lot about a line of business, and we also understand that bridging the gap between these three functions in a company is very important in order to get the right solutions out there. And definitely something that we would like uh, to talk about today and share the knowledge that we have achieved uh, or have obtained over the last actually two years we've been working with the ERP specifically, and that we would like to share with you uh, from that point of view. So stay tuned for that uh, as, as we advance and go on. So um, it appears that we, we have a, um, I, I call it a vision, but maybe that's a little bit too bold to call it a vision, but, but we actually believe that uh, if we look at it, maybe the time has come now where we can, where we can achieve this fully digital exception-based quality. So this is about uh, going into your company every day and look at a dashboard and see how compliant am I. Uh, and this is very, very, uh, very, very new compared to how we've usually been seeing things when it comes to compliance and validation. And there are some certain things here that are enabling us uh, to get to this point. I'm not saying that we're getting there tomorrow, but we will probably get there in a couple of years if we do things right. The first thing that's here to support this journey uh, towards this uh, way of looking at quality is technology. As you have probably noticed, uh, I'm sure you have, uh, we see a lot of cloud-based systems out there even being uh, adopted into the life science segment. That constitutes some challenges uh, that we're going to talk about today on how we maintain the validated state of these. We have the regulatory bodies, uh, FDA with the CSA coming out, uh, and I think it's out in June in, in 2021. It should have been here uh, the 20th of September this year. But actually the CSA initiative from the FDA is giving us a justification to use automation tools and a lot of other uh, interesting stuff which can enable the digitalization of compliance within uh, our industry. There are some things that are also enabling this and obviously also is required in order to get to this point. And, and, and the first and the, maybe the most important thing is that we need in our companies to have mature quality processes. We have been going on at the pista shouting from the rooftops for years about having a good quality process, processes and also the ability to be able to measure these. If we have mature quality processes, if we have automation tools which can basically uh, support us in, in, in uh, in testing and what have you, then we are really in a situation where we can use these new systems to obtain fully digital exception-based quality. But let's talk about that as we go. Uh, and I will start by uh, presenting a little bit on, uh, on, on ERP in the cloud and, and the usual way of doing uh, validation. And then we will switch to Annie yeah. later. 
and then we will talk about uh, the news from CSA and what the impact of CSA is on validation of ERP systems. But let's begin uh, with speaking about uh, the cloud, which has really arrived uh, in life science, and we've seen it for a while now, and we've seen it on some of the specific systems, uh, EDMS, CTMS, and those types of systems. But we're now also seeing that extend and expand into more general uh, products, more general systems, such as ERP. And then we believe in Epista that that uh, constitutes one big uh, opportunity in order to cope with some of the challenges that we had uh, before. In the old days, we would typically in the ERP world, we would have an on-prem system. We would spend a lot of time in having a project validating that system. And what usually happened in the old days was that once that system went live, we would grandfather that system because the validation challenge of uh, updating, getting new patches, uh, new changes to that system would constitute one big challenge. And as a consequence, people were reluctant to do that. Now, the challenge with that approach is, uh, is quite simply that your business will evolve uh, over time. And if your system does not evolve with your business, then you will have a mismatch between the functionality that you have in the system uh, and in, uh, with the business uh, as it is. And what, what used to be the case was that after five years, six years, maybe even uh, longer than that, you would be in a situation where the mismatch would be too big. And in that case, you would have a new system installed or a big accumulated a major release that would come onto the system. And then you would be repeating uh, all of your project, all your validation all over again. Uh, and then you would repeat that every three years, every five years, or every 10 years. The new model, the SaaS model, software as a service, is quite different uh, because every once in a while, uh, and depending on system, we will have to receive a new patch. Uh, the, the system is continuously being updated by the vendor. That's, of course, good uh, when it comes to uh, the mismatch between the business and the functionality because that really gives us the ability to change the system. And we are actually forced to change the system. And when we are forced, of course, we, we do it. But there is a catch to this. And, and the catch is that uh, when we talk about maintaining uh, the validated state of an ERP system, uh, it really comes with a challenge because uh, then we will need to do a lot of retesting. There will be a lot of different uh, stuff that needs to be done uh, for each specific patch. We need to talk about change. We need to talk about how can we make sure that we cope with this challenge. And if you read the title of, uh, of, of this webinar, it's all about seeing the project as being the preparation to uh, maintain your validated state. So preparing for a good operation and maintenance of your system and a good model for that. And that is actually quite a shift in paradigm. In the old days, we would have a lot of time spend a lot of time on doing the actual implementation, doing the validation, have all of our focus on that rather than having it on an operation and maintenance of the system. I don't know how many times we have been doing implementation and we've said to people, now you should think about the operation and maintenance early in the project, uh, but what turns out is that it's maybe the last thing we talk about. And the minute we get into hypercare, we are actually literally already out of compliance. So here's actually a major opportunity to rethink that setup and plan for that because you are going to cope with it. And with all these different patches coming out uh, once in a while, we're in a situation where you have to cope with it and where you have to live with it and where you have to be efficient about the operation and maintenance and all of the stuff that comes with it. So let's talk a little bit about the stuff that comes with it. So the cloud really makes a challenge to maintain the validated state of the system. We're getting new patches. Uh, on in frequently getting new patches, and it will give us an extensive amount of regression analysis and regression test that will be required for each update and each main release. We also need to have documented processes in place to ensure that we are inspection ready in handling of those changes and those releases. And think about the fact that we, we will also have to have competence available, many different kinds of competence, competence on the platform, competence of your configuration, and even competence from the vendor. When it comes to changes, we need to also be able to, uh, to evaluate the new functionality that's coming in. Do we want to turn it on in our system or do we not want to turn it on in the system? 
a lot of different stuff required, which will also give a, give the need for a for a more comprehensive governance of this. I was sitting uh, with a with a company two years ago, and uh, they were trying to adopt. Uh, actually, it was a dynamics uh, system into their organization. And Microsoft at that time was saying that they would, would be having uh, 12 new releases every year. Looking at that company, they were saying, yeah, but, but how can we, uh, in any situation, how can we repeat the validation every time we get a new patch? It's just not suited for life science. So that's when two years ago, based the pioneering new methodologies, we started to look at how can we actually do this in a sensible way to make sure that we maintain the validated state of the cloud-based ERP system and things that we would like people to consider and what we recommend people to consider is to utilize test automation in order to be able to control what's going on but also to minimize the effort that is required in regression testing and, and, and testing in general. Much, much more about that uh, later in this webinar, but just uh, to, uh, as a cliffhanger, say that that will be back uh, in a couple of slides time. Before we get to that point, let's talk a little bit about those uh, software as a service uh, systems and how they are organized. Generally, these, uh, these uh, systems consist of a platform. We call that software as a service. It has a, a number of different layers from networking up to the actual application with the standard functionality that is part of that specific application. And what is new compared to the old days is the fact that all of this is run by the vendor. So whether this is SAP, whether this is Oracle, or whether this is Microsoft, they are all taking care in their hosting center of all the different stuff that's going on on this platform. And we really can't do anything uh, to, to, uh, to make any changes on that or make them do things differently. And we have to accept that that's the way it is. On top of that, we will have what I tend to call configurations. And Ali is always asking me, so Klaus, what do you mean about configurations? But what I mean on co about configurations is everything that is not part of the standard. So it can be anything from a new list to a new table, but it could also be a process that we put it specifically in for our, our company. And that would be something that is not part of the platform, but something that we put uh, on top of, uh, of the platform in order to uh, make the system behave according to the requirements we have in our company. I think we should take on configurations later as well, right? Yeah, we talk yeah. a little bit more about that take to that. be more specific there because Annie is not happy with, yep. with my definition. So also give you some clarification on that because it's probably bad. What we do and what we do recommend, recommend and what we say is really working is to look at this in two different regimes when it comes to uh, compliance and validation. Software as a service, the platform, we talk about qualification of that. So making sure that we understand what is the vendor really doing making sure that if there's something that they need to do that they don't do, that we fill in the, those gaps as part of our operational state when we, when we monitor and operate the system. So that could be everything from checking that backup restore has been performed uh, to periodic review of users. But in reality, what you should do there is to look at everything that we have in 21 CFR Part 11 and then Annex 11, compare that to ITIL and make sure that for all of those operational procedures, that we do have controls that we can monitor as a company. And by that, we actually qualify uh, that specific system. And you may ask, what about the patches? Uh, how do we make sure that those patches are okay? And the answer to that is we actually rely on the vendor to be in, in control of those patches and our controls uh, to make sure that they are in control of what they are doing. And this is the way we look at that. The configurations, uh, yeah. What I usually say here is that, that we have to follow what we call the normal ERP validation procedures. So for each of the configurations we have, we will have to define requirements, we'll have to do function specifications, design documents, and qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. And then we need, of course, to uh, tie the two things together. So we, we use governance uh, to make sure that we have the right hooks between the configurations and the platform to make sure that these are synchronized. But we will have more about that at a later stage. So that was the structure. And then I was saying something like, we should prepare for the operational state of the system. And I was also saying that there were some challenges associated to that. And I was also saying that we should consider a test automation as part of that or consider. And we have given this significant thought over the last two years. And we've been talking to a lot of different people. We have been talking to our own subject matter experts internally in our company. 
and there is only actually only one solution to this. Our way of looking at this is to say, well, if we can automate what used to, used to be the OQ and the PQ of an ERP system, and we can repeat that every time we get a new patch, then we're actually in the ultimate situation where we can prove to an inspector that we are in control of what's going on. There is no better evidence for an inspector to see an OQ or a PQ that has been uh, repeated every time that there is a new patch. And I think that's the ambition level you should be looking at, is to automate that rather than do regression testing and rather than do risk analysis and then and do uh, different things. Look at the test automation, cover as much as we possibly can on the test automation, and by that we are securing that we are staying in control, not only with the platform from the vendor, but also with the configurations that we're putting on top of it. More on that later. We actually had a, a question coming in uh, right prior to this webinar, um, and, and that was a, that was a, a very specific question coming in, saying that the, it would be really nice if the piston could talk a little bit about how we document the requirements on a high level, uh, how we relate the GXP requirements, uh, the critical ones, and the user requirements, which are nice to have. I want to talk a little bit about that because uh, I always like uh, getting questions in advance because then we can then we can talk about it. So so let let me talk a little bit about that. So, let me see if I can get my markers to work here. I, I think I can. So, I have a laser pointer here. We are preparing, when we're doing ERP validation, that the main focus here is to prepare for the operation and maintenance of the system. And preparation for the operation and maintenance, well, we really have to have good traceability in what we do. How else can we show to an inspector that we are in control of what's going on when a new patch is there? If we want to adopt a new change, we also need the traceability because we need to understand the impact of the change on the documentation that we've been providing as part of the project. Our recommendation is to build the traceability as part of the implementation project. So if not the very first thing you do, you probably want to have some good requirements first and foremost, but once you have the requirements, what you do then is build the traceability as the first thing. And let us talk a little bit about uh, that traceability. We believe a lot in, in, in making requirements uh, to an ERP system. We like to uh, apply risk assessments to the requirements. And, and, and please follow me when I say that this is a two-dimensional approach to the things. We divide requirements into GXP requirements, not GXP requirements. We can have also business critical requirements, but definitely have different kinds of criticality on the requirements from a functional point of view or from a process point of view. So that's one dimension. The second dimension is about how is that implemented in the system. So is it a fit on the platform? Is it a gap on the platform? And depending on whether this is a fit or this is a gap, we'll have different test regimes or scenarios to associate uh, those specific uh, requirements. So for instance, a GXP critical uh, requirement, which is a gap, where we are doing something specifically to the system, we will be subjecting that according to the old computer system validation requirements. And Annie is going to talk about CSA later, and there is some impact coming out of that. But quite frankly, looking at, at that, we would do a tremendous amount of testing on an ERP validation, whereas if we have a GXP uh, critical requirement, which is a fit, we would do less rigid testing. And, and, the, and the whole key here is, to figure that out when you do the validation plan. So we have these four scenarios or maybe a little bit more. And then depending on where we are in these scenarios, we define up front which documents we see on the design side and which documents we see on the uh, on the test side in order to make sure that we do proper testing, proper validation of the different requirements we have. That's about the requirements. But there is a second thing that uh, that we didn't get the question that I would like uh, I would like to emphasize also, and that is is that we when we look at the traceability and we again look at the operational maintenance challenge, the key is to do the traceability on the process level. So the overall requirements that we are having for an ERP system should be articulated as a process, and the traceability on the test side should be traced back to that process. And why is that important? That would be important because when you get into the operational maintenance phase and you see a specific change coming from a patch, if you can trace that to the process, it's much easier to handle than if you trace it to 50 different uh, functional requirements. So we like to work with that kind of granularity when we talk about traceability uh, in, in, in this uh, case. 
So that's about the, the, the requirements. And, and, and quite frankly, depending on the requirement, we would have a process uh, description here. We would have specific design documents. We, can, we, uh, we recommend you also to go with the ERP vendor standard documentation on this. And then we would have uh, different testing. So that would be anything from a system integration test, a user acceptance test, even IQ and OQ on, on the right hand side of the V when we follow the OCSV uh, process. And depending again on, on the four different risk classes that I was uh, talking about before, we would have different uh, test regimes on that. So perform your risk assessment, make it two dimensional. That's the first advice and rec rec uh, recommendation from us. And, and, and then secondly, when you do your traceability, trace it to the process, because that's the most feasible way of making sure that we can maintain the validated state during uh, operation and maintenance. So that's one important uh, recommendation, two important recommendations from us. Second recommendation is to look into this automated uh, test uh, and, and do whatever we can to automate whatever we can, because if we automate, then we can repeat it as part of regression. Uh, and that is really, uh, that's really key uh, in order to, to be successful when it comes to maintaining the validated state. I mean, in this Microsoft example, 12 releases every year, that's one a month. I know that they've taken it a little bit down actually, but it's one per month. Let's say it's down to eight now, I guess. But even eight a year, and you are doing comprehensive testing on everything on each patch or doing risk assessments, et cetera, it's going to be hard to achieve that within a month or within a month and a half. So you need that automation. You need to you need to think it into your project. You need to definitely include it uh, as a scenario for how you're going to do uh, uh, the ERP project. I have been specifically looking forward to this slide to be to be very honest with you. And and, and the reason is that uh, we have over the years heard a lot about uh, agile projects. Yeah. We also heard a lot about uh, the, the, the mismatch between agile projects and uh, and the V model because V model in its uh, in its uh, nature is uh, is a waterfall model, whereas agile is much more uh, anarchistic. Can I use yeah. that word in yeah, a I, word? I can say that I guess. Yeah. Uh, and we never really had a good uh, answer to uh, to to the agile uh, and, and and the validation uh, and, and the coexistence of these two. With the inclusion of automated testing, and this was actually one of the things we were investigating as part of our uh, journey uh, towards the uh, automated testing, was also to look at how do we solve uh, the agile uh, challenge, whilst at the same time securing that we can maintain the uh, the, the validated state of a cloud-based system that is going live. And I'm just going to build up this slide uh, really quick and, and then use my marker uh, to explain. So this is a typical ERP project. Uh, and, and this is uh, driven in, a, in an agile way. So we have sprints. These sprints are organized into waves. Uh, we have some way. We have, for instance, three uh, sprints in every wave. So in total on this slide, we would have nine waves. Uh, sorry, nine sprints uh, consolidated into three waves. The way we recommend to uh, maintain the validated state of a cloud-based system in an efficient way and running agile projects is for every wave to do an automatic recording of the test cases that are associated to a specific wave. So we have three sprints, wave one. When we complete wave one, we look at the different artifacts from the, the, the three different sprints. We look at the things that are scenario based. And remember my remark about the traceability to the processes. This is why we want the traceability to the processes because the recordings we'll be making and the automation we'll be doing uh, on these specific sprints will be the scenario-based ones, which are basically one-to-one -one relationship with the processes. So for every way, we will record test cases in an automated test system. Go to wave two. When we complete wave two, we'll record the test cases that are associated to wave two. We will rerun the ones that were associated to wave one because, uh, hey, it's agile, right? So it may have changed. We are in an anarchistic world. So we repeat what we did in the, the ones from wave one. And when we get to wave three, yeah, it's the same principle. So we will be repeating everything we did in wave one, in wave two, and then we will call us, consolidate all these scenario-based test steps into uh, wave three, on the completion of wave three. Now, this gives us uh, actually quite a large number of advantages in the way that we handle uh, ERP validation. 
first and foremost, we can actually do real unstructured testing while we're doing the automated testing because we can actually change those test scripts as we go uh, as part of the sprints, as part of the waves. That actually means that we can do that without having any deviation management uh, because it's still informal testing. In a situation where we then consolidate these uh, automated test scripts into one pile of test scripts, and then after uh, completion of wave three, we can go into the system integration test and the user acceptance testing, where we, we would we be repeating these uh, different uh, automated test scripts as part of the validation. And then we can do formal deviation management, and then we can handle uh, the different de uh, deviation and do that formally. But we can wait until a very late stage uh, if we do it in this specific way. And the things that you cannot automate, because I think there are some of you out there who would be saying, but you can't automate everything clouds. No, that's true. But we will complete those automated test scripts with some paper-based test scripts, and then we will uh, then we will basically execute those as well. In the very old days, we would be doing IQ, OQ, PQ. In this case, we will use the vendor term, so the user acceptance test, which in essence is the PQ. We will be doing that uh, with a high degree of our test automation as part of that. Why is this important? This is important because now we actually did automate the OQ and the PQ, and now we're in a situation that and after the next patch is coming when you're going into the operation and maintenance, the first thing we will do when we get a new patch in the test environment is to repeat those OQs and PQs. And by that, day, we just performed our regression analysis. So really preparing for operation and maintenance by putting automated test scripts into uh, the project. And it is really true that we are preparing for the operation and maintenance because that's where we get the real challenge now. It will change. We know it changes uh, and therefore we prepare for it. I hope this makes sense. Uh, if, if if not, uh, we, we have our email addresses uh, as the last line, I think it is uh, in this day. Don't be shy. Uh, if you want some more explanation on this, uh, then, then then feel free to reach out to us. And I promise that I can I can personally speak about, I think three hours about this. So, uh, but, but uh, definitely a lot of stuff to talk about on this. On automated testing, it is, why, why didn't we do this a long time ago? People sometimes ask me when I talk about automated testing. And, and, and the answer is we did not have the right tools. In the old days, uh, we would be uh, coding and programming test scripts. We would be spending a significant amount of time on doing automatic testing. But, but now we are actually in a situation where there are new tools out there, which are easy to use, can be used by the end users, and we don't require programmers uh, to do the actual testing and or the actual test scripts. And this is important for many reasons. It's important because it's easier to adopt them into the project, but it's also important because we don't have to have the discussion, should we validate the test tool? Uh, how do we know that it works? If that's intuitive, uh, if it's a standard piece of uh, software, it is actually a gap category one, believe it or not. I can also talk for hours about that. But it is actually a gap category one system, and it does need to be validated. It needs to be qualified. And then we have good processes for securing our recordings in, in, those, uh, in those test tools. I want to give you a little bit of, a, of, of advice on this also when you're looking at these test tools, because there are quite some. There are not too many, actually, but there are some out there. And, 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 and there are some good uh, rules of thumb uh, rules of thumbs in, in terms of uh, selecting these uh, specific uh, tools there. The first and, and, and most paramount is that uh, you select tools that are code free. You need something that can record and replay or where you can, uh, let's say in an easy way, model uh, the different processes you have. We, we like to have a record replay because they can be used by the end user and actually you can build it in so that when you're in a workshop on the ERP system and you're doing your acceptance of the requirements for a specific process, why don't you record it there? And then you have your PSQ script uh, available and ready already at that time in the project, rather than doing the test tips and the test scripts at the end of the project. And it just is a nice way to talk to your users about uh, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Once you are ready, do the recording, and then we have both the specification and also uh, the test script available. We also think that flexibility is uh, is, is uh, important when it comes to the to these tools, and, and this is this is really really important. You are in a situation where you're getting new patches uh, once in a while in the, every year. And every time you get a new patch, there will be small changes to your system. 
And as a consequence, you will need to change those test scripts just a little bit. And then it's important that you, in an easy way, can modulate and change those test steps just a little bit, just tweak them a little bit and not being forced to do a whole recording or a whole new iteration of, of that specific test step. So that flexibility is really, really important. And, and then finally, find a test tool which, that, which is not limited to the system that you are testing. Find a test tool which can do uh, other stuff. Alone in the Microsoft world, I, I don't know, if, if we have an ERP system, we may have five or six different other applications that are closely tied to that system. And it would just be ridiculous not to have a test tool that can test all of it and do real end-to-end -end testing. When we're doing traceability to processes, we need to have test tools which can basically do the end-to-end -end testing. So that was a little bit uh, on, on different concepts. Now we can, we cannot, uh, in one hour, we cannot achieve to go into to, uh, really many details, but, but I hope that you get my ideas behind this. Make sure you prepare for that uh, operational state of your system. Make sure you consider that uh, test automation. Make sure you do your requirements classifications at least in two dimensions. Make sure uh, that you do all of the stuff that I have been talking about for the last uh, couple of minutes. This is what we traditionally talk about when it comes to, uh, not traditionally because cloud is quite new. It is, it is quite new, Annie. And, um, and then something uh, really new came because uh, then we, then FDA started to talk about the cloud and, and started to talk about all the different stuff and all the challenges with the yes. cloud. And then I then the uh, I think it's the Center for Devices. Yeah, it actually is the yeah. Devices. Yeah. And they were basically looking into how can we do things uh, differently and, and and we also always a little bit. Uh, I don't think the word is concerned, but we are a little bit uh, we observant. We observe, yeah, very. The Center for Devices uh, come up with new uh, guidance because uh, <laughs> those were the guys who gave us a 21 CFR part 11. So usually yes. what they do is uh, pretty important in IT. Yeah. But if you guys are not aware of uh, the fact that uh, on the 20th of September this year, so this is a couple of months ago now, uh, it was actually, we should have seen uh, some guidance coming out from the FDA on, on, on CSA. It was postponed on 2021 and it was due to Corona. Yeah. Uh, but, but we have a lot of information on it already. And, and I think, it makes sense to talk about that in, a, in an ERP context. And and then before I hand it over to you, yeah. I just want to say that 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 what the FDA are saying themselves uh, is basically that uh, they want to uh, they want to change the paradigm from providing a lot of documentation and 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 a little bit of critical thinking uh, to, to flip that around and 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 do more critical thinking and and less documentation. And in many ways. It gives us a justification for doing some of the stuff uh, that I was talking about already. But it actually also gives us a justification to do things uh, very, very different. Very different things. Yeah. And, and I think we should uh, we should talk a bit about that. So, so I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, Annie, on this. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, well, basically, I've been reading very much about PSA. Um, I'm quite at this. As there is actually no deadline and no uh, guidance about this yet we actually don't know what the content is so a lot of this can be just good ideas but i do see a lot of paradigm shift in actually doing what you have done before because now as you're looking into the company and the world today a lot of new tools are coming a lot of new ways of thinking are coming up and as you said you should be scared every time you have medical device defining anything for you right <laughs> <laughs> because this usually puts a lot of stress on a company what FDA has discovered in, in medical devices is, and I've been working with that for many years, well, is well, that, so don't say that, yeah. right? <laughs> is that when, when you're working in medical device companies, the tendency is that you don't change anything. You don't have the nerve to change anything. And the reason not to do that is simply because it takes so much time for you to get in an, or in, a, in the same state as you were before you began, right? And then you either do as many companies do, stay put, just be there, make it work, regardless of it's working for the company, mm -hmm. just make it work. Uh, or you can do like others, me included, say, okay, it didn't work, so I want to do something different. And then you get touched by, by all of these different requirements. And often you get touched by auditors coming and say, and now I want to see the validation. Yeah, right. But hey guys, I'm still in development phase. I need to understand what 
to actually validate. Um, and I've done that a few times, and, and what happens is I usually get a year more <laughs> to do the validation. But I have to do the validation regardless whatever I would like to do, right? So, so really having gone into this CSA, looking into validation versus now assurance, it's actually pretty much similar to the development process of medical devices. So all the interactions that you're doing through the stages of the R&D is pretty much the same that you're doing here. So let's look into what FDA actually is saying here. They are saying that PSV adds 80% documentation and 20% testing. I will not quite put it like that, but we will come back to that. And the CSA will put then 20% on documentation and 80% of testing. And that's pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest things about that, and maybe I should change the slide here because I think it's a good idea to do that. One of the major difference from, from CSV to CSA is the risk part mm -hmm. and the scoping of the risk part. Because looking into this, it actually says you need to define your system by intended use, which is quite new. You never define a system uh, upon the intended use. You define it on, I want maybe a bit of that and a bit of that and maybe something here. And then you have to use your requirement specification, right? That's actually not quite what they're saying here on CSA. You need intended use. In medical devices, intended use has to be as broad as it can be. So you don't have to do too much on your clinical evaluation part, right? Too specific, too much work on the clinical evaluation. That's just how it is. So you can actually work with your intended use saying, okay, what is it that I want to do with the system? So you can actually narrow it down. So usually out of the box system on ERP roughly gives you about 300 requirements at this. And then you can add on the different development uh, parts that you need in order to obtain, I want this report, I want maybe to do this in a different way. So we need to ask Microsoft for, for recoding of exactly that uh, process, right? What actually happens here is when you do the intended use, you can skip all of those that really does make sense for anyone to have if it haven't had a patient risk impact. Okay, so we're restricting to patient risk and data integrity and yes. to standard functionality. Exactly. Okay. So you're going to get rid of that, meaning that almost in the first run, you can get rid of roughly about 25% of the of, requirements. Of the requirements. So, so, any, so in, in terms of uh, yeah, risk and scope, and yep. it's basically around scope. So did, did, did they give any indications on a typical ERP or a typical system even that how much would the savings be? So, so I can understand that if we, in GAMP we have five risk categories and we have a three-dimensional, I think, uh, data integrity, patient safety and product mm -hmm. quality. And then we need to test everything rigidly, more or less. But this actually states that it's only the, the custom ones that really has a, yeah. a patient impact that should yeah. be tested. Did they give any, any indications on, uh, on on the savings when it comes to requirements? In, in term, yeah. Sorry, I, I haven't found that. Okay. Not the savings part, but I found on the uh, workload. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, so exactly, that's, yeah, that's, that's more like that. Looking into a usual test uh, setup when you have an ERP system, you roughly use about 3,500 pages of testing because you're testing all your user requirements specification. Every small thing are tested, and it's scripted. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky, you get it automated, right? So you can run it over and over again, if you're lucky. Yeah. A lot of companies don't have that as is. So they have to treat their use of uh, specification every time. A patch comes, right? If you look into this kind of risk assessment, then you're down to only those that are in limited and robust testing, which has to be written down. Mm -hmm. So roughly looking at that, 220 page ish, so that's depending on how much actually of your high risk so requirements, right? 500 to 250, that's significant. Uh, that's a significant uh, amount. And again, you can look into that because looking at the risk part here, having the implementation definitions and the implementation method and insurance activities, right? Then you can actually say, okay, if I break down my system, we just put away roughly about 20, 25% of the original part. 
from a system. And then we're going to say, okay, how much of this is actually out of the box? If it's out of the box, then you can actually refer directly into your vendor. Okay. So trusted vendor are now everything. Yeah. So for example, taking part 11 audit trade, looking into that part, you can refer now to Microsoft's SOX report yeah. because it is there, it's stated. Then you can of course argue, is this a configuration, yes or no? And this is where we came back to configuration, right? Because in my world, it's a setting. Is it on or isn't it? If it's on, let's just verify it's on. Yeah. And that's it. Then it should be set for the and, system. And that's how we get from the 3,500 pages down to the 250 pages or whatever you mentioned. So that is trusting your, trusting your, trusting uh, your, vendor, your vendor is one of them. Yeah. And then being much more, how do you say that? Um, not rigid. But the opposite? Less rigid. Less rigid <laughs> in testing. Yeah. yeah. So let's go next to next let's slide. Let's talk about the testing then. Yeah. So all about the testing. I see that as the huge paradigm shift that we have here. So looking into the risk part, then you have these different sets of uh, testing. You have unscripted testing. Uh, and number one of that is, of course, this part where you trust your vendor. Number two of that is here where you do this testing, more or less exploring testing, I would say. And three is where you start getting into this game where you actually need to have some kind of confidence that you have done it. It's meaning that you need to, in any way, when you're testing, say, okay, I've been in this area, I've done it like that. You don't have to do the test script, but you have to have some kind of clarification that you've been there, right? When you come into the limited scripted testing, then you start having these documents that you need really, this is how I want to test my, mm. my uh, process. If it's GXP, for example, it's high risk impact, you need, of course, to have both the positive and negative testing coming out, right? That's only for the fives, I guess. That's the only for yeah. the yeah. And then you need to, of course, ensure that you have someone who has signed off, say, okay, this is this the is right fine. test. Yeah. And then you need to test it and then you need to sign it in the old fashioned way. Yeah. But then again, limited and robust testing is coming after all the things that you can do in pre advance. So coming to the next slide and you go into the project part, I still have the same kind of overall project structure because it's pretty much the same wherever we see it yeah. now on ERP system. We don't see IQ, PQ, or OQ any longer. Well, some companies do actually still talk about it, but it's really not what we see from the implementation partners, mm -hmm. right? So going into to still the same uh, project part, going into the validation, you start off with an intended use. Together with your intended use, you start your change management process, which all medical device companies really have. Otherwise, they will really not get certified at any point in time, right? And then you also add on your risk assessment. But here the change is that you don't have to have a specific URS ready from the beginning because your implementation partner is working together with the customer on what is actually the requirements on this system. Mm -hmm. So instead of having all of that up in the front load of the project, you can now leave it open. You can choose a system uh, that controls and handles your requirements over time. And then you can just do the risk assessment when you start doing the implementation of the project. So much more iteration. Yes. Less, less and you decision. mix that together, of course, with the unscripted testing. Yeah, yeah. And why am, am I, and why am I actually just touching the unscripted testing here? Because it's not necessary at this point of view to do the scripted testing because you don't know if your system actually works, no. because you're building it simultaneous as you're running it, right? Mm, makes sense. So a total different paradigm shift in that. So you don't have these regional parts where you need to stop. You can do the chain management. So once in a while, every, I don't know, every month, every second month, you can stop up and say, okay, what was actually going on from when we had last month to this month? And then you can report it in your management change instead much more flexible yeah yeah than we are used to total different so uh, setup right you cannot do this just like that 
that's not possible, right? You need to have some very good decisions coming up. In the beginning of the project. In the beginning. So okay. let's go into that, yeah, right? Into that. So again, the scoping of the intended use, that's so vital. Mm -hmm. You need to decide on the IT solutions, not only on the ERP system that you want, it could be, of course, Microsoft, which for my part is preferable, but it could also be SAP. You need to figure out what are the tools that you want to have in the beginning of the project. Because as we're not now putting everything in force on the URS, we need a tool that can control all the requirements that are actually developed over time. So a good tool for controlling that. Then you need a very good tool afterwards to either have this scripting going on or the optimization. I think you can do actually both here. Because looking at the CSA, you can see that it's not necessarily needed to automate it. It makes sense based on the patches coming up. Or, exactly. And throughout the year, because you will be touched on that. And of course, you still need to have to maintain the, the validated state. But you can also just go for random testing again, and then just take the tested script and test those when the patch comes. I think some of some of us who have been in the CSV world for for a while and uh, for me a long time, actually a too long time, we said, but where's the evidence? What about the documentation? And I guess that well, I, I know that this, uh, the, the FDA guys are saying, well, we don't need uh, the documentation in the same way as we used to. We, we will now mm -hmm. only what makes sense to the company. Yeah. Uh, we will accept that. Uh, I, I, I don't think you can do it revolutionary all the way through. I, I don't think so, even though I know they're saying this. You still need, as I just told, some kind of understanding of where are you and what have you tested. And this is where I really see change requests coming in order. Um, as to change requests, which are vital when we're talking about medical devices, if anything are changed in the, in, the, in the medical device or any process, you need to control your change request. So there is a lot of focus on ensuring that the change uh, requests are updated mm -hmm. simultaneously as you walk through the project. So it actually there you have your statuses. So you cannot just do randomly testing and think everything is fine because in some way you still need to go down and say okay what was it actually I went through? Are there any deviations? Because one of the things that starts when you started like this is actually the deviation part mm -hmm. that starts from the beginning. You need some way to control all the deviations if they have actually been uh, make sure that they have been closed or if they are running based on bugs in the system or there is a code if difference coming up. So all of that actually needs to be controlled. And that's a bit different from, from yeah, the other. Yeah, but right? it's also taking things to be more like an assurance approach than being a control yeah. approach, which yeah. is the old CSV approach. So, so, so it makes kind of sense. And I, and I think you are right also on that, that this is a transition that is probably not going to be, uh, you know, open up. <laughs> uh, we have some inspectors that we, uh, that, that we need to um, make sure that they are happy also in, in, yeah. in a transitional state. But, but I think the numbers are, uh, that you were mentioning, are, I mean, it is, it is, it's, it's quite substantial. It's substantial, so there, yeah. there is no doubt about uh, the fact that it, it makes sense to go and have a look at these CSA concepts and see if we at least can use them as, you know, just justification for, for what we're doing. Exactly. And especially the risk assessment part where, where we are looking more into the, the, yeah. the patient safety rather than, uh, than, than testing everything as, as we're used to. So I hope at least that, that you guys, uh, that you understand it's a new subject and again uh, only coming out as guidance in, in 2021 but, mm. but it does really make sense to, to take a look at it and I think uh, the DFDA managed to convince Annie at least. And, uh, it's certainly, yeah, I love this, I love this. I absolutely love that and, and yeah. I'm a little bit more conservative but but, but I think it's, it's definitely the right way, uh, road to take uh, to be more risk uh, based in the way that we exactly. do things. Exactly, but then again a lot of this is also speculation, so you have to consider yeah, that because it's there's it's no guidance. No. So this is my top of mind, yeah. how I see it. And if I'm right, it's going to be fun. Yeah, 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 it'd be fun to do validation of yeah. ERP systems. That would be that would be nice. But that's how it is on the forefront. I mean, so so yeah. Please don't take this as being a, you know real rules out there, but but some considerations coming out of the FDA and and we're doing a lot to follow this. And then can can also I mean your name is also on the, on the last slide. So yeah. 
if you have any questions on how to do things and then what is the steps, then please let us know. That was the CSA, an interesting uh, topic. We, we like it. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit uh, and then only a couple of slides uh, before we, uh, before we, uh, we, uh, we wrap this up. So going CSA or, or, or staying on the CSV, uh, the, the, the application monitoring the challenge is still the same. So it, it is about making sure that we maintain the validated state and even maintain the operation of the system. One thing is validation, but it also needs to work, right? So, so it is really important that we we do get to uh, that we do get to control these uh, different um, uh, patches that are coming out, and making sure that things are working. We've been looking also uh, into some standards for um, for for uh, patch management, release management, and and this is an example uh, that that we are using that procedure that we are using for it. Where it's about analyzing the, the net change report for coming out from the each patch, uh, talk about uh, performance GXP assessments. Once we do the GXP uh, assessments, then look at the impact on uh, the documentation that I was explaining before and the granularity of that. And then make sure that we update the different documentation as we go. Goes without saying that the more we can automate, uh, the less uh, is the effort in, uh, in, in, in maintaining these uh, different patches. And, I was actually talking to a company uh, not too long ago, I think it's two or three weeks ago, and they were saying the way we want to run this is by defining the amount of time we require on testing for each specific batch. We want to be able to do this in five days. Okay. And that was set as a target. I actually think that's pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. And it's very, very cool. Yeah. And there was, of course, one of these uh, visionary uh, companies out there that we need to be able to do this in five days. So the way they were looking at it was rather than talking about how we do the project and all this different stuff, they were looking at the operation means and saying, yeah. we need to handle the patch and the testing in five days. How do we do that? How do we put in the automated testing? How do we do our risk assessments? Because this is the KPI uh, that we are working uh, according to. And I think that is pretty interesting and, and actually probably a very good proof of the fact that we should be preparing for, for the operation and maintenance because that is where the real challenge is. So I think I was almost the interrupting anyway, but I think that uh, looking at time, that that's, that's probably what we have planned to uh, to talk about uh, on, on on this webinar. Hope that it was helpful at least to give uh, some indications on the uh, on on the practices that we are using, but also to uh, throw a couple of hints on the CSA. And and I, I really encourage everybody uh, to have a look at, at the CSA stuff. Uh, it's on FDA.gov, so you can go in and have a look at it there. Then I've promised our marketing people also to say a little bit about what's going on uh, at Epista. And, and, and if, if you like uh, to look at the, the trends uh, that are in, uh, in, in here right now and in the market right now, you, you might want to follow our trend talks. We had the first one going out uh, on September 23rd, and that has a little bit more detail on the paradigm shift between CSV to CSA. So mm -hmm. if you like Annie's numbers uh, on, uh, on validation, <laughs> then you probably want to check that out to get some more detail on that. Then we have a new one coming out on December 3rd, which is about automating tests in order to improve quality. So a little deeper dive into the test automation and, and the stuff about we're talking about there. And then uh, on, on, on uh, February 10th, we will be talking about uh, how we can achieve that initial vision that we had on the, I think it was the very first slide, which is about how do we achieve full exception-based validation. And so how do we get those dashboards to monitor uh, compliance of your system real time? Thank you very much for your attention. If you should have any questions uh, or comments, uh, mm -hmm. please let us know. Get in touch. These are the, the names of uh, the two of us okay. and our contact details. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, in, in case you have any comments or questions to us. Yeah. Shall we say thank you for the attention? Yeah, we should. And also take care out there, right? Yeah, take care as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.